Hello, and in this session, I would like to talk about the topic of crystals. Um, crystals and gemstones have been a topic of controversy. There have been an area of contention amongst believers, uh, even amongst sons, for some time now. Um, so I will be sharing the perspective that I have as it pertains to the conversations that I've had with God and some of the literature in which I've been reading. So it's a mix of both, but they don't contradict. So one of the common stances that I've heard and I've been seeing regain some traction as of late is the notion that crystals are witchcraft. Um, now, interesting enough, this uh, presumption, this perspective is found nowhere in the Bible. We do see the Bible or the writers of the Bible make very clear statements as for how witchcraft is viewed um, within it, where it really has a zero tolerance for witchcraft. That much is true. But there is not a single verse nor implication by which the use of crystals is included as a form of witchcraft. That's not something that's in scripture. Um, Usually, the logic, one of the most common trains of thought that I've heard comes from, I believe it is the book of James, where it talks about, if any among you um, is sick, let him go to the elders. They will anoint you with oil. They will pray for you. Um, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Like, they will use that verse and say, the Bible says to use oil for healing, oil for prayer. Um, it doesn't say anything about going to get a crystal, but understand logically that the um, the lack of a statement is not the presentation of a notion in that what the Bible, let's just say, let's say the Bible is ultimate authority. What it does not say has no authority. What it does say would have some authority, but the lack of a statement is not a statement in itself. So while the scriptures in that verse does not say, uh, go to the elders and they will take their quartz and they will take their amethyst and they will heal thee. It also doesn't say use oil, don't use crystals. That's our modern logical thinking. That's our own biases being imposed upon the scriptures. Um, in fact, nowhere in scriptures are stones or crystals seen as a negative thing. They're not presented negatively. Um, because they're not. <laughs> um, in fact, should you look, um, well, yeah. So if you look back in the old Testament, you see the, you see the stones on the ephod uh, on the breastplate that the high priest would wear. Now this was a garment of one of the most holy men of the time, one of the most holy individuals of the time, which didn't just have a crystal or two, but was in fact littered with crystals. And I will go back to that point because I want to prove a point much later in this video. But they were included. They were of heavenly design <laughs> uh, included within the garments of the high priest. When we look at the kingdom, let's just talk about their kingdom function. I am a kingdom man. When you look throughout heaven, when you look at the imagery of heaven, there's nothing but crystals all over the place. They are a heavenly technology. So not only are they found throughout the scriptures, but throughout all of the literature that describes heaven, precious stones, precious materials, crystals and gemstones are found all over. In fact, one of the most common things that people know about heaven, whether they've been or not, I, I, I recommend people go for yourself to see what's really there. Um, one of the most uh, immediate things that people know about is the pearl gates. Pearls are gemstones and that's in the gate. So before you even get into heaven, you see crystals. You go, there are gemstones there are crystals there are stones all over <laughs> all over heaven there's entire seas made of crystals right it doesn't even seem as though god elohim is presented as being anti-crystal because 
is domain is made of crystals. Even going into the human anatomy that we have several crystalline structures built into our anatomy that serve that have the same technology as crystals that grow out of the ground. For one, your pineal gland is a crystalline structure that's built into your head. God put that there. Um, your bones also carry a similar effect to crystals. Specifically, and this is something that I love as a scientist, every one of the stones that was uh, mentioned to be on the breastplate of the high priest is a stone that has a, this property called uh, piezoelectricity in that it has a property that when put under stress, it creates electricity, it produces power, and it begins to glow. Um, if you want to test this for yourself, take two quartz crystals and rub them together and you'll begin to see lightning sparking between them. They are built that way, right? So we use crystals in a lot. In fact, if you have ever used a quartz watch, those things function by way of a crystal embedded on the inside. If you use a smartphone, they run by crystal. <laughs> um, the ancient world used crystals to power their machinery because they uh, release an almost infinite, limitless source of electricity. They just grow out of the ground that way. So I present it as one of the greatest notions that we have a loving God that created us and created the world is that before mankind got here, we were placed um, in a situation of abundance, in a situation of provision in which when we got here, there were already things here that were able to heal us, that were able to help us, that were able to assist us. Um, we're familiar about the uses of different herbs uh, that have different uh, a attributes and abilities to help us in different ways. Um, one of those uses is oil, um, in which you're able to crush and process and strain out the oil, the essence of a plant, which can then be used for different applications. And almost all oils that come from plants heal some type of disease, some type of ailment. They're pretty much all good for the body. In similar fashion, crystals are the same way. But if you were afraid of doing rituals to access the power of a thing, you have to do less to a crystal than you have to do in order to create oil. Um, I can understand the argument that oil may be unnatural because you have to process it, which still doesn't mean that God hasn't vouched for it. Um, we have to be processed. That doesn't make us witches <laughs> because we undergo a process to uh, have that which is within us come out of us. But crystals need no ritual. They just grow out of the ground with the ability to heal or aid us in different facets of life. There are some crystals that deal with blood health, some that deal with the heart, some that deal with lungs, some that deal with eyes, some that deal with overall relaxation, some that deal with the impartation of energy, um, some that boost joy, some that boost love, some that boost compassion, some that boost wisdom and insight. Um, some that heighten awareness. These are crystal. These are things that grow out of the ground. They needed no ritual in order to tap into. That is the presentation of a loving and caring provision, uh, intuitive God. That shows the loving nature of a God that he put all the stuff necessary for us to be our best selves. So I've heard the argument before that the stones on the breastplate weren't used for anything mystical. They were just uh, metaphorical. They were symbolic of the tribes themselves. And while I do agree that they were symbolic of the tribes themselves, they were still mystical artifacts. Um, and when you begin to look into Hebraic culture, you find that there was more mysticism than would make the average believer or so-called believer comfortable. Um, they, I've often heard the term divination be thrown around, um, which is funny because I found that Christianity is very selective on which forms of divination 
they deem holy or devilish. Um, there's divination all over Christianity. Many different facets, a lot of the foundational things are forms of divination. In fact, one of the most prominent, which would be considered absolutely foundational, um, is the necessity, the law, the rule that you must hear God through a book. That is a form of divination known as bibliomancy. Uh, biblio or Bible meaning book. So it's the divination through book. Divination, uh, divination being the process of obtaining uh, information, revelation, connection um, through some outer court means, some indirect means of communication. So when we're talking about bibliomancy, it's the process of trying to interpret the will of God, the voice of God, the stance of God, the nature of God through the book instead of through God. That is a form of divination known as bibliomancy. Feel free to look it up. Now, that form of divination is very much prominent in Christianity. It is foundational. In fact, if you do not divine in that way, you are labeled as a witch, a heretic. They call it Christian spiritualism um, to trust the voice, even though the scriptures that they say to be trusting always presents a speaking God, not a writing God. In that the God that's found throughout scriptures is always seen speaking to people. And then God said to Moses, and then God said to Abraham, and then God said to Noah, and then God said to this person, and then God said to that person. He seems to be speaking more than you find him writing. Yet, in modern culture, we were convinced that to hear the voice of God is irrelevant or it's secondary, maybe even tertiary, unnecessary altogether. But what you must have is the scripture. And that is the way in which you hear God. Now, that form of divination was A-OK, -okay, so I'm not really sure why. Let's just say that the use of crystals is a form of divination. It seems to be one that the Hebrews, that the people in the Bible, were A-OK -okay with. Um, but just to crush the notion that they were only symbolic and had no ability of their own, I will be reading a portion of text from the legends of the Jews. This is Jewish slash Hebraic literature, right? Um, feel free <laughs> to read this yourself to make sure that I'm not adding things in. Um, and I am reading the Lewis uh, Ginsburg translation. And this section that I'm reading can be found on page 402 of the version that I have. And it reads, the 12 stones differed not only in color, but also in certain qualities peculiar to each. And both quality and color had a special reference to the tribe whose name it bore. Reuben stone was the ruby that had the property when graded by a woman and tasted by her of promoting pregnancy. For it was Reuben who found the mandrakes which induced pregnancy. Simeon stone was the smart, uh, woo, <laughs> however you pronounce that, that has the property of breaking as soon as an unchaste woman looks at it. A fitting stone for the tribe whose sire Simeon was kindled to wrath by the unchaste actions of Shechem. It was at the same time a, warring, a warning to the tribe of Simeon that committed that committed whoredom at Shittim with the daughters of Moab to be mindful of chastity and, like its stone, to suffer no prostitution. Levi's stone was the carbuncle that beams like lightning, as, likewise, the face of that tribe beamed with piety and erudition. The stone has the virtue of making him who wears it wise, but true wisdom is the fear of God. And it was this tribe alone that did not join in the worship of the golden calf. Judah's stone was the green emerald that has the power of making its owner victorious in battle, a fitting stone for this tribe from which springs the Jewish dynasty of kings that routed its enemies. The color green alludes to the shame that turned Judah's countenance green when he publicly confessed his crime with Tamar. Issachar's stone was the sapphire, for this tribe devoted themselves completely to the study of the Torah, 
And it is this very stone, the sapphire, out of which the two tables of the law were hewn. This stone increases strength of vision and heals many diseases as the Torah. Likewise, to which this tribe was so devoted, enlightens the eye and makes the body well. The white pearl is the stone of Zebulon, for which his, mer his merchant ships he sailed, the sea drew and drew his sustenance from the ocean, from which the pearl too is drawn. The pearl also has the quality of bringing its owner sleep. And it is all the more credit of this tribe that they nevertheless spent their nights on commercial vineyards to maintain the brother tribe Issachar that lived only for the study of the Torah. The pearl is furthermore round like the fortune of the rich that turns like a wheel and in this way the wealthy tribe of zebulun were kept in mind of the fickleness of fortune dan stone was a species of topaz in which the in which was visible the inverted face of man for the danites were sinful turning good to evil hence the inverted face of their stone the turquoise was Naphtali stone, for it gives its owner speed in writing. And Naphtali was a hind let loose. <laughs> Gad stone was the crystal that endows its owner with courage in battle, in battle, and hence served this warlike tribe that battled for the Lord as an admonition to fear none and build on God. The chrysolite was Asher stone. And as this stone aids digestion and makes its owner sturdy and fat, so were the agricultural products of Asher's tribe of such excellent quality that they made fat those who ate of them. Joseph's stone was the onyx, which had the virtue of endowing him who wears it with grace, and truly, by his grace, did Joseph find favor in the eyes of all. Jasper was Benjamin's stone. And as this stone turns color, being now red, now green, now black, so did Benjamin's feelings vary to his brothers. Sometimes he was angry with them for having sold into slavery Joseph, the only brother by his mother Rachel, and the mood that he came near betraying their deed to their father. So I've gotten to the properties that each of these stones had. They weren't just symbolism. They had special abilities according to Hebraic and Jewish literature that in their culture by which uh, your Jesus comes out of, they weren't just symbolism. They were mystical. And yes, very much so. These stones were also used for different types of healing. They were not in contrast with the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll actually read a section below this, which is still on the same section. Uh, the 12 stones in the breastplate with their bright colors were of great importance in the oracular sentences of the high priest, who by means of these stones made the Urim and Tumim exercise their functions. For whenever the king or the head of the Sanhedrin wished to get directions from the Urim and Tumim, he betook himself to the high priest, the later or the latter robed in his breastplate and ephod, bade him look into his face and submit his inquiry. The high priest, looking down on his breastplate, then looked to see which of the letters engraved on the stone shone out most brightly, and then constructed the answer out of these letters. Thus, for example, when David inquired of the Urim and Tumim, if Saul would pursue him, the high priest beheld gleaming forth the letter Yod in Judah's name, Resh in Reuben's name, Dalet in Dan's name. <coughs> Hence the answer read as follows, Yared, he will pursue. The information of this oracle was always trustworthy for the meaning of the name Urim and Tumim is in fact that these answers spread light and truth. But not every high priest succeeded in obtaining them. Only a high priest who was permeated with Holy Spirit 
and over whom rested the Shekinah, might obtain an answer. For in other cases, the stones withheld their power. But if the high priest was worthy, he received an answer to every inquiry. For on these stones were engraved all the letters of the alphabet, so that all conceivable words could be constructed from them. So we even see that in order for the high priest to use these stones in such a manner, to use them to the full capabilities, he had to be flowing with Holy Spirit. Which is my next point, is that uh, the use of crystals is not something that is in opposition to the power of God. It's not anti-Holy Spirit. It's not a replacement. They actually work together very well. But we even see as the high priest used them, he would look down and see which stones shine. Remember, I taught you all a word if you didn't know it. Piezoelectricity, in which when these stones, every stone on the breastplate is piezoelectric, which means when it's put under stress, it charges with electricity and begins to glow. This is something you can do yourself. By taking crystals and rubbing them together, you take quartz, you rub it with another piece of quartz, you will see sparks of electricity start to shoot through it. Every one of the stones did that. So as the power of God pressed against it, the spirit of truth coming out of the individual would press on the stones and would light up the necessary stones. So we actually see uh, even Holy Spirit working with the stones to work with the high priest. So no, the use of crystals is not witchcraft. Do witches use crystals? Sure. But are the crystals witchcraft? No. Quite the opposite. <laughs> uh, crystals have been holy throughout mo the majority of history. In fact, they still are. Um, it's been only in recent times following the Rockefeller Foundation, where the use of crystals began to be demonized because he wanted to uh, really push a more pharmaceutical means of healing. So up until Rockefeller, uh, the use of crystals was common practice, even amongst those who lived in the States. And it's around that time we see people start to lean more on medicine. Funny enough, the word for pharmacy comes from a Greek word, which is pharmakia, which means medicinal witchcraft. Now, funny enough that all of these preachers who say, oh, I don't need no crystal. I just need the Holy Ghost. Will still consider it a OK should their members go to the pharmacy to get their medication. In which the pharmacy, the pharmaceutical, comes from the word pharmakia, meaning medical witchcraft. So that witchcraft is okay. <laughs> uh, other goofy logic is that um, that same verse from before. They say the scripture says to use oil when praying for people. Okay, that means every time that you did not use oil, you were out of order. See what happens when we make scripture say stuff that it doesn't. We would back ourselves into corners. Um, but this is also the error of simply not having the conversation with God to begin with. Some of this stuff is goofy, <laughs> and that's one of them. Most people never had the conversation with God. Most people never asked God, um, were crystals an a okay thing or not? They just heard some man or woman of God that they respected say to stay away from it. So they built their doctrine off of peer pressure. And that was it. There was no intimacy with God. There was no holy conviction. Just peer pressure. This man of God that I respected. Oh, this person who casts out demons said to stay away from crystals. He must know what he's talking about. He used to be in it. That type of stuff happened. Saying, y'all know how I feel about that form of peer pressure. I'm the number one um, advocate for learning the voice of God yourself and obeying that voice. Um, so I don't even want you to take my video and just say, oh, look, another credible person. Um, this is the truth. I want you to go ask God some questions. Say, hey, is Nelson on to something or did he make all this up? Because he likes using crystals. And in fact, I do like using crystals. I used back when I was a Christian, I thought it was witchcraft because I was taught that it was witchcraft up until I started having conversations with God. And God said, when did I tell you that? <laughs> I never told you that. 
And I was like, well, such and such said it was witchcraft. He said, I didn't tell them that either. And that's when I began to explore and I begin to realize that this was a technology that goes in tandem with our sonship, that goes in tandem with our mysticism, that goes in tandem with our kingdom walk, not against it. This will actually in this will actually impact you in a positive way to begin to incorporate crystals into regular daily usage. They have different properties for the body. They have different properties from the soul. It's a possibility they even have applications for the spirit. But there's no necessary ritual to be done with most of them. Having them around is enough to benefit you. So no, you don't have to pray over it. You don't have to uh, leave it out in the sun. You don't have to charge it. You don't have to uh, really do anything to it. <laughs> It just grows with the power to help because understand this, the natural world is quantum in that everything is light moving at different frequencies. Crystals release certain frequencies that benefit us <laughs> because our body itself is several frequencies uh, condensed into form. So when you are interacting with crystals and even oil, <laughs> you're dealing with yourself on a quantum uh at the very least cellular level but still quantum in that it's the vibrations it's the frequencies that are put within the oil that are put within the crystals that are benefiting you on a cellular yet quantum level could even be atomic in some cases um but i believe i've gotten my point across that's it for this session leave some comments down below um link to all of my stuff is in the description patreon my book uh the discord community all are welcome later